Hi, and welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. This is our first case study uh, YouTube video that we are going to be talking about. And the first case that we're going to be talking about is the Litchfield Triangle. So take it away, Dad. Okay, I'm Paul, by the way. That's I'm Ben. In case you don't know. This case was one of the most interesting we've done, and it was especially interesting because it was the first one in which I really worked with Ben. But in August of 2005, uh, we found ourselves at a 1793 farmhouse in Torrington, Connecticut. Now, the same family had lived in this lovely home for six generations. But before that, it had been a general store, mm -hmm. right? Now, the um, woman whose name was Donna Philly, uh, she grew up with constant activity. And uh, there were presences, sometimes of, uh, she felt, at least of ancestors, uh, sometimes of something else, things that she couldn't really identify. But there was never anything negative. She would be sitting in the living room, and they, they would literally look at, there were legs hanging from the ceiling, walking as though on a surface that wasn't present in our world. You know, I mean, who, who could make this up, right? There were horses, this still goes on, horses galloping up and down the hallways, although I've never heard it myself. However, on our first visit, uh, I believe it was August 21st, 19, uh, I should say 2005. That was a while ago. You were in the, you were 13. You were a little, a little lad. And uh, <laughs> we went into the dining room at the time, and I remember you, you could feel, you, but we both commented on it, people were kind of walking. Right? It, was it, was really, it was really stuffy. It was like you were standing yeah. at like a train station, like a subway stop or something. Yeah. Well, I went outside maybe to get some air, and uh, I literally heard, uh, standing over by a wall, uh, the the sound of a horse coming from the distance. But, I mean, there was a building over there, and I mean, this is a very rural area and woods. Mm. But it came galloping by. I couldn't see it. And I, I could, uh, so you, but you could feel the wind and the leaves on the trees were moving as if something had actually galloped by mm -hmm. across the paved road and into a, into the woods over the, on the other side. So quite bizarre. Uh, ordinarily, when we go into a case, it takes, uh, I know in, in my experience too, it takes, it takes a while for the chemical mix to kind of get used to your presence. That occurred the first time we were there. Uh, also, uh, the family would report, and all the, the, it wasn't just Donna seeing this, it was her husband and her daughter uh, and the grandson who lived there at the time, seeing very large, tall, hooded figures, extremely thin. Now, uh, we know who they are, but yes. you know, but that's another story, perhaps for later on in, in the discussion here. Yes. Uh, there were strange, non-human figures uh, seen in the rooms and dancing by the windows. But again, nothing negative seems to have been been going on in this case or even alien like figures looking down from stair landings and that sort of thing all sorts of things like that and in 2005 donna read our book or well my dad's book i should say footsteps in the attic and thought the multiverse ideas uh were really the best explanation for what was really going on you're not dealing with spirits in our opinion you're dealing with time uh, but time really doesn't exist so what you're dealing with is parallel realities all taking place at the, at, at the same time, all simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, for some reason, at certain points, you're, you're hooked up with that, and you, you pick it up almost like a radio, and you can, uh, you're not hearing the sounds of the past. You're hearing the sounds of the present in a parallel world where, to us, it's the past. So, in any case, uh, that was where we had um, uh, came in, in 05. But then some uh, even stranger things began to happen, or at least things that hadn't been noticed before, because we began to look outside of this area and sure enough this area turned into what we now call the Litchfield Triangle. Uh, other neighbors were having things that were going on. Since we started investigating the every time it, yeah 11 years ago it's, it seems like every other day something weirder and weirder happened yeah. and we're like, no nothing's gonna top it and then more and more weird things happening. So by 2009 there was there's was reported military activity from very very reputable sources. Oh yeah. Good, yeah. good friends of ours who um had relatives who were going to go fishing at this certain pond in the area and were escorted off the property by military personnel. Yes. There were also reports of people driving on the wrong side of the road for a while. Yeah, but public changes in behavior is probably the best 
Yeah, that was that was the weirdest thing because it, it went from people driving on the wrong side of the road when everyone started complaining about it. It turned to people tra- crashing into was it trees, it's crashing into trees, they were driving just crashing like an inordinate trees. number amount of people in a tiny town in Connecticut beyond st- st- statistical probability. Yeah, and whenever it was noticed in the media or social media, then the behavior would change. Right? Didn't it turn to suicides? Yes, most ominously, it turned. To, there were there were ridiculous numbers of suicides. Yeah, like very like way out of probability. In, yeah. Yes, and so it got it got weirder and weirder as time 2010, went on. 2011, 2011, and 2012. Yeah, essentially. So in about so, 2010, when we went to the area that was well known uh, to make a pilot for our uh, TV show when we were at, when we attempted it, it was I think it was the third try that we were going to make a TV show. I think thing. it was the first time. So the um, the military activity seemed to be centered around a, uh, a a farm where there was no farming going on, and it seemed to be abandoned. A check of the property record showed an absentee landlord who never has shown up. And when we were there in 2010, uh, there's a photograph that shows, an aerial photograph that shows the old farm buildings all decrepit and falling apart. And all of a sudden, uh, the following year, these by 2012, these had disappeared. They had been torn down. Nobody somehow ever noticed any activity. Yeah, I don't know how. Excavation is very a loud lot of excavation, and, and yeah. it's very noticeable. <laughs> well, we did go by and then we, we saw power shovels. You know, and that sort of thing, and, and dirt piled up, but that could have been anything. That yeah, yeah. yeah. However, there was a, a rather interesting house, a small house, with not really a farmhouse, but like just a house with, with a metal roof, mm-hmm. uh, and the um, vehicles were very often parked there. We never quite caught the military going in and out, but there were there were several Humvees in there, at one point. Uh, several points from the aerial photographs. Uh, and then all of a sudden in 2013, where the barn had been, it had been completely smoothed over, no, no basement, nothing. There was a, a huge metal sheet, thousands of square feet, that could only be seen from the air. And we had, um, um, we're scratching our heads at that, and then all of a sudden the following year, um, a, a new barn went up, uh, very lovely, lovely, beautifully constructed. It looked looked like nothing else, uh, so much as a an English dairy barn, you know, with a kind of long and then one entrance where the cows come in and out. But there were no cows. There was no uh, farming of any kind. I don't know. I know you're a little sensitive about getting into things that happen to you because you don't really remember a lot of things. But uh, there was at one point a a I suppose I could call it a block house. There was a windowless cinder block building with a huge antenna. Right yeah, that was really weird farm. because it was in the middle of, of a clearing in the woods where there were these power lines running away from the farm where all this activity was centered, but being the military activity. And we followed these power lines and they went into the woods into this just this completely cinder block house with a vent on top and there's barbed wire around it. So it's not like you could climb over and get in. Mm. There's no door or anything. Well, your opinion was that there was research going on into the uh, the nature of perhaps of what are commonly called portals. We would call them parallel world intersects, yeah. and how power could be generated from them. All right, and then of course the, this suggested that uh, someone would perhaps like to weaponize the paranormal. And why was this place, if this is true, why was this research going on? In an area within 100 miles of New York City. Why wasn't it in the middle of the Nevada desert or something? Mm-hmm. Well, because uh, theoretically they would have to go where the intersects are. So if this is uh, theoretically going on, uh, generating power from multiple world intersects or portals, as you suggested originally, mm-hmm. uh, it may be taken further uh, to the idea that maybe they're trying to weaponize these portals or whatever you might call them in the intersects and perhaps use them to appear to manipulate time and space. Uh, military experiments with uh, the paranormal are, are not new. No. They've been going on at least since the 1950s. Uh, back at the farmhouse uh, that night, we uh, had said goodbye to the, the crew from New York and uh, we were outside um, very, very cold, I remember, November 2010. It was really cold. And uh, the a little boy in the house who had had a number of experiences, this is the young grandson of Donna, mm. uh, who was four years old at the time, and he said that um, his invisible friend, Ashwar, was in the tree in the front of the house mm-hmm. because her people lived in trees. That's how he put it. And so uh, we, we went out, and uh, you were kind of sitting on the porch, and I, I took the uh, my little um, Vivitar infrared camera and just shot, took a little footage from up in the tree. And sure enough, uh, when we looked at the footage, there's a, a, a thing coming down out of the tree. 
it looks almost like a tadpole, and then the, the final frame, the whole thing washes out and the thing disappears. Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah. So was this Ashwar? Well, before we uh, found out any more about it, uh, it turns out that uh, a man in Florida, um, Gregory Harold, uh, had obtained a very similar creatures on his backyard uh, security video in the 1970s. And we hooked up, and sure enough, uh, much of it is, is very similar. Now, now several years later, uh, we, we brought our friend uh, Shane Searway into this case. Shane is a, has the wonderful combination of being a very foot-on-the-ground investigator uh, and a bi uh, big, yeah, Bigfoot shaman. No, a, <laughs> a Blackfoot shaman, sorry. And so th that um, makes him, uh, gives him a very good combination of skills. So... He happened to uh, look up, did some research, and sure enough, he comes up with Ashwar, not A S H W A R as we expected, but A C H U A R, who were either tree spirits or tree people from Central and South America in ancient times. Oh, there, there we go. So now, how does this four-year-old boy in Torrington, Connecticut, come up with this name Ashwar? Uh, we were really scratching our heads about what we were dealing with. And we refer to these as flap areas. Mm -hmm. And each of these you know, is in paranormal flap, all sorts of paranormal events going on that are seemingly unrelated, but maybe drawing uh, the same energy source, and that's the, the intersects of various worlds where various things are taking place, and you happen to encounter them and see them and feel them and hear them and this sort of thing uh, if you're in the right place at the right time. Or the wrong place at the right time. Well, we um, seem to have discovered through all of our efforts the points in the triangle, so to speak. One being the, f the house that we initially started mm -hmm. investigating. Number two being the farm. And three being, being this strange brook. Which you found yes. uh, as point number three uh, in 2010 as we were making that pilot. Yes. I don't know if you want me to describe what happened because you don't remember it. I really don't remember it. I do recall, though, uh, seeing the, this like stone structure... Sort of when we got off of the road, and across the way there was a was a former Boy, Boy Scout camp. Well, it was supposed to be a, a, a non-functional summer camp. Yeah, that got bought up by With private trucks buyer. Coming in and out. Yes, yeah. yes. In so, so across the, like right off of this road. There was a, a sort of a stone circle with a big stone in the middle, and then there were four stones on the outside. So I went over, and I sort of poked the stone, and then after that, I remember nothing. You, you collapsed, and it was rather muddy. Was that what so on camera, uh, and with the director there, at one point, rose off the ground several inches. And... Uh, this as I, we have never been allowed to see this footage. I would really like to see that because I, I would too. I the way <laughs> the way you say it, I just I, I partially don't believe it. I didn't believe it when <laughs> I saw it, you know. So this was point three, so we judged, and I remember you looking uh, up because you could still see the road and the trucks coming in and going out of the other location. You said they're looking in the wrong place. Yes, I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was that, and we have not been back to point three. But then there is the Bigfoot factor. The Bigfoot. <laughs> in, these, in these flap areas, somehow Bigfoot always seems to turn up. And, of course, UFOs, at one point in 2010 and 2011, people were getting out of their cars in this vicinity, uh, Torrington Goshen area, and, get out and looking at the lights in the sky at night. And uh, the question may arise, well, okay, well, how big is this flap area? Uh, well, you've got about a, a central triangle of about maybe five square miles, and then you have perhaps uh, 50 to 100 miles, square miles, around this, in which things uh, have occurred. Now, now the, the objection may be made, well, you know, are you not being arbitrary? Just something, if something takes place within the vicinity, it may or may not be related. Well, that, that could be true. Uh, there is a certain arbitrary nature to, to talking about a triangle or, or a flap area. However, uh, I think you have to get your, your, your hands onto something to hold on to, mm -hmm. and that, that is a place from which to, to operate, to gather data, and to see what we can do. Uh, about it, so that's that's where we are now. But it does take years. The more you look, the more you seem to find. Some may, may a skeptic may say, "Well, the more you look, the more you're going to find, whether it's there or not." Maybe that's true. But we try to be as careful as possible. We att we attempt to employ disciplined thinking as much you can as you can in an undisciplined and unscientific field that may, some may say is outside of science. So we do the best we can, and we just gather information. So okay. our next step is this neighborhood meeting. Now, um, in comparison, 
we've been working on, you haven't even been there yet, but Shane and I have, uh, a Western Pennsylvania flap case that seems to be very similar to this, but which the people are, are very, very, they're, they're so fed up with what they see there and, and feel and happens that they're very, they were very anxious to talk to us. We already had a neighborhood meeting and we were only on our second expedition uh, several weeks ago. So that's, and you've got military overflights, very low flying black helicopters, as you still do in the Litchfield area. Mm. So um, where this will go, I don't know. How far we can get, I don't know. But we have uh, It some, seems like the possibilities are infinite at this point. Well, we have some fine people working with us. On yes. It. Uh, not only Shane, but also Mark D'Antonio from uh, MUFON. And Mark is a, is a legitimate astronomer, one of the clearest thinking people I've ever met. And uh, absolutely brilliant. And he, uh, MUFON, uh, the Mutual UFO Network, is a very credible organization because uh, we don't work with anybody who's not, not credible. So somebody who's incredible. Yes. So uh, in that case, uh, so that that's our next. Uh, there is so much to this. It doesn't seem to end, and it just keeps getting bigger. And uh, all we can do is try to keep up with it and uh, try to bring it all together. Well, I guess that's pretty much it. What, we, what anybody can say is there's always more to learn and there's always more to observe, and you know, some t- we we're, it's all the first day of school. Every day, yes. every day is the first day of school. True. So thank you for watching. Uh, next time we're going to be talking about the uh, f- the Pennsylvania flap. And uh, if you want to find out more about us, you can go to our website. That's behindtheparanormal.com. Uh, we have a book coming out in January uh, that is Behind the Paranormal, Everything You Know is Wrong, and that's being published by Schiffer Books. And you can also go to our website and find out about the other books my dad has written, including Footsteps in the Attic and Faces in the Window, as well as um, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Also, all Turning sorts of home, good stuff. Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. I'm really bad at this game. So, <laughs> so Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. And you can find out more about that behind the paranormal.com and our regular radio show with all of our recorded shows on that website as well. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. <laughs>